Kazuo Kodama, President of Foreign Press Center Japan, and I will moderate today's online press briefing. Now it is our great pleasure and honor to welcome our special guest today, Mr. Angel Gurria, OECD's Secretary General. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, he is not able to physically visit Japan this year, but he kindly accepted our invitation to join this online press briefing organized by Foreign Press Center Japan in cooperation with the OECD Tokyo Center. Let me say a few words about our Foreign Press Center Japan. Since its establishment in 1976, we, the FPCJ, have supported the foreign press, foreign media reporting on Japan through press briefings, press tours, and individual reporting assistance. This year marks the 45th anniversary of the FPCJ, and I feel very grateful to Secretary General Gria for accepting my request to address both Japanese and foreign media journalists today. For the first half of this 60 minute briefing session, which is supported by simultaneous interpreters, he will share his views by answering my questions, beginning with his legacy as the Secretary General of the OECD, the longest serving Secretary General since 2006. Over the last 15 years, Japan has had ups and downs, just like any other country in the world. What is remarkable with Mr. Greer is that he is a true friend of Japan. On March the 11th, 2011, the Great East Japan earthquake struck Japan. In response to this cataclysmic disaster, the Secretary General visited the disaster stricken Tohoku region and announced his intention to support the reconstruction and development of Tohoku. The Tohoku School project was born at that time. OECD's NEA, Nuclear Energy Agency, has steadfastly extended its support for Japan to tackle the challenges of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear accident. And in May 2014, the government of Japan hosted the 2014 OECD Ministerial Council meeting for the first time since 1978. I was the Japanese ambassador to the OECD at that time. The main theme of the Ministerial Council meeting was resilient economies and inclusive societies, empowering people for jobs and growth, which I believe is even more relevant for the global community in 2021 and beyond. Indeed, over the last 15 years, Japan has been struggling with crisis after crisis and the OECD under the leadership of Secretary General Korea has always been together with us, along with all the member states of the OECD to which we are most grateful. This is why there are many questions which we'd like to ask Secretary General Korea. Before going to my first question, I would like to invite Secretary General to say a few words. So Mr. Gria, floor is yours. Thank you, Ambassador Kodama. Delighted to see you again, even if only virtually. Um, and thank you for the kind introduction and the opportunity to participate in this press briefing with the Foreign Press Center of Japan. I have many ties, you know, that have been given to me every time I visited uh, the, uh, uh, the F, uh, FPCJ. Um, the, the Foreign Press Center of Japan, uh, because also I'm Japan a, Press Center uh, as well. Japan Press Center. Well, yes. the, 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 I'm, I'm an old, I'm an old, uh, an old hand there. Uh, I have visited Japan about seventy times, and I have visited the press, the press center, God knows how many times. But at the same time, our office is also in that same building, yes. Uh, yes. the OECD. Yes. So we're very familiar. Now, the damage of COVID nineteen across the world has been enormous. Three million lives have been lost and counting. The economic impact on households and firms has been huge. But, uh, you know, we'd like to think that the worst is behind us. We unfortunately see 
that now localize in some countries, you have these flare ups uh, in countries that are very, very populous, uh, like uh, in the case of uh, India, for example, uh, uh, and, uh, and others where uh, you have uh, these, uh, these uh, very big numbers again. But uh, no, our, our most recent projections for the world economy uh, after a contraction of 3.4, 3.5% last year, is that this year will be 5.6% growth. So world output should return to pre-crisis levels uh, by maybe half the third quarter of uh, 2021. Now this projection crucially depends on the race between vaccination rate and the spread of emerging variants of the virus. The recovery will be uneven across the globe and many countries may need more time to return to pre-crisis levels. So governments must continue to provide fiscal support. They also actively must use policy instruments to restore our economies and to, as I say it, build forward better. Now for Japan, the recovery is an opportunity to create a more resilient, inclusive, sustainable future. This will require action on several fronts, as well as building on successful past reforms. So some of the key areas, first is uh, one of Japan's biggest challenges remains rapidly aging uh, population, which is also an issue that is facing other countries in the region and, and in the OECD. Now Japan, has the highest old age dependency ratio of all OECD countries. In 2017, there were over 50 persons aged 65 or above for every 100 persons aged 20 to 64. By 2050, the ratio is going to rise. Um, and, uh, you know, from 50 should rise to 79. Now, extending working lives has helped boost labor force participation in recent years and has offset the impact of aging. However, in this era of 100 year lifespans, Japan needs to shift to be more flexible employment and wage systems. Um, and uh, systems that are based on performance rather than age to better utilize its human capital. Now, precisely to make the most uh, of the uh, digital transformation, Japan should also invest in skills for the middle-aged and older workers and on policies to minimize the digital divide. In second place, COVID-19 hit women particularly hard. In Japan, while women's employment has increased significantly due to labor shortages, women are still underrepresented in leadership positions. For example, women make up less than 10% of lawmakers in the parliament's lower house. Women also still face obstacles to employment, such as being the main family caregivers. Promoting work-life balance and flexibility, as well as measures to stop discrimination, would lead to greater roles for women in the post-COVID era. Our third is that the recovery is an opportunity to make growth greener. In the Asia Pacific region, natural disasters, including storms, flooding, have been more frequent and more severe which is very likely the consequence of climate change. And of course, Japan has been in the front line of this. Japan has been focusing on the question of disaster remedies for many, many decades now. Sustainability requires enhanced disaster prevention, enhanced disaster management. But most importantly, it involves reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So we commend Japan and other countries' recent commitments to achieve carbon neutrality. 
or what we call net zero emissions by 2050. The OECD stands ready to support governments in the implementation of the Paris Agreement goals, including through the new International Program for Action on Climate, so-called IPAC. And then finally, last year demonstrated that trade and global value chains were crucial to overcome the pandemic. Equally, international collaboration will be essential for a resilient, inclusive, and sustainable recovery, especially for the mass production and the widespread distribution of affordable vaccines. Japan has been a leader in concluding regional trade agreements, such as a comprehensive and progressive agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, the so-called CPTPP, the uh, Economic Partnership Agreements and the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, the so-called RECEP, as well as spearheading efforts to create common rules for digital trade in the G20. Our analysis found that CPTPP alone could lift real incomes by almost $500 per worker in the medium term. And crucially, the more countries that participate in efforts to reduce trade costs, the more comprehensive these efforts are, the greater the benefits. Japan's leadership, including on issues of digitalization, sustainability, innovation, will play an essential role. So Ambassador Kodama, dear friends, Japan has made a lot of progress over the past 15 years although challenges remain. The OECD stands ready to work with you and for you in designing, developing, and delivering better policies for better lives in Japan, in the Asia Pacific, and beyond. So, arigato gozaimasu. Thank you very much, Secretary General, Mr. Gria. Very comprehensive. And then very also yet uh, uh, focused to the point to the challenges confronting Japan, Japan economy, and then also maybe uh, not only in Japan, but also in the Asia Pacific also context. Thank you very much. Now, uh, the remaining um, more than 50 minutes, I have just a few questions uh, to also to, to have a lively discussion with you. Um, now, let me start with a foreign question. Uh, first, looking back on your 15 years, uh, Secretary General of the OECD, could you name the most difficult challenges you have faced? What were the finest achievements of the OECD under your leadership? I'll be very grateful if you could relate also your answers to Japan's role in the OECD. Secretary General, please. Well, uh, first of all, let me uh, say, uh, you, you mentioned this before, in March 2011, Japan suffered one of the most devastating disasters of its recent history. Now, I had been to Japan uh, more than 60 times by that time. So, you know, I, I was very familiar, but, uh, and, and I visited Japan soon after this triple shock um, in, uh, in April to offer in person the OECD support and the commitment to Japan's recovery and reconstruction. I remember with Nikkei-san, uh, we had a big lunch all uh, with the with vegetables and and uh, uh, the uh, even the sake, uh, uh, the 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 fish, everything um, uh, was from Fukushima, from from that region, uh, to show our support. Now we also, as you mentioned, launched the OECD Tohoku School project one year after in March uh, 2012. This project gave birth to a new, more global innovative schools network, linking schools, not only across Japan, but also in countries like Indonesia, the Philippines, Singapore. Uh, the project also gave uh, OECD member countries an impetus to rethink the purpose of education for the future. And it resulted in a new project 
uh, which is called The Future of Education and Skills 2030. Now, I visited Fukushima uh, in 2014 to meet with the students of the OECD Tohoku School. And the Tohoku School students came to Paris uh, for the event Tohoku Wa, uh, La Renaissance, on uh, August of 2014. You remember well. Uh, at the Champ de Mars, we shared the outcomes uh, of their projects. And um, they came to the OECD headquarters um, in the 2nd of September. Uh, we planted together a cherry tree that is uh, doing very well and that always represents this, uh, this, this joint effort. And um, you know, I visited uh, Japan in April to commemorate Japan's 50th anniversary of membership, including to opening a, a symposium hosted by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. It was our, our first Asia Pacific member country, Japan. Uh, it, way, it, 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 it paved a way to, to strengthen the OECD's ties with the region. Japan has been a strong supporter for programs to promote investment and improve corporate governance, not only in Japan, but also in the ASEAN region. Japan chaired the MCM, the Ministerial Council meeting, for the second time uh, as a way to mark its 50th anniversary. The OECD Southeast Asia Regional Program, which then Prime Minister Shinzo Abe and I launched at the 2014 Ministerial Council meeting, is a core tool in our engagement with the region. Ambassador Kodama was its main driver and served as first co-chair of that program. Thank you very much, Ms. Uh, now may I go on to the second question. What is your assessment of the trajectory of the Japanese economy? You mentioned already in your initial remarks to a certain extent over the last 15 years. And what are the challenges confronting Japan today? Again, you, you touched on it already, but again, uh, as you suggested solutions, as well as your suggested solutions to them and prescriptions, if any. And for your information, Prime Minister Suga, successor to Prime Minister Abe, has declared a Green New Deal and digital transformation as the twin topmost priorities of his government. Please, Secretary General. Well, uh, listen, uh, first of all, uh, let me uh, join the rest of the world uh, celebrating Japan's commitment to green growth and to the Green New Deal that was launched by uh, Prime Minister Suga. Um, Japan, Japan's outlook uh, for the next uh, couple of years is generally positive. The recent um, interim economic outlook that we uh, put out projected economic growth of 2.7% in 2021. Now, major policy challenges have remained broadly unchanged. Price inflation remains muted. Productivity growth relatively sluggish, fiscal sustainability in the long term, of course, something to keep an eye on. 15 years ago, the OECD was advocating regulatory reform and to reduce labor market dualism in Japan. And many of these challenges remain. Japan has been addressing these issues. And the policy has evolved, in some cases, helping other countries understand the challenges they face. Uh, for example, Japanese monetary policy is being studied intensively by other central banks that are confronting subdued price inflation. The sustainability of public finances remains a challenge. But of course, lower interest rates now, very low interest rates, historically low interest rates, higher debt levels are easier to manage. Now, one of the recent successes has been helping more people into employment. Women's labor force participation rate is now higher in Japan than that of the US. And as a result, GDP per capita growth 
has been relatively strong in comparison with major OECD economies in the years leading up to the, to the pandemic. Now, the government has set ambitious goals to green the economy and um, is strengthening its strategic approach to, um, for, for, you know, to prepare for the digital transformation, to make the most of the digital transformation. Japan's new IT strategy envisages what we have come to know now the fourth industrial revolution powered by the internet of things, big data, artificial intelligence, uh, all that will have the cloud, you know, will have a big bearing um, on the growth of the uh, Japanese economy in the years to come. But Japan is also a champion of data free flow with trust. And I would say this with trust is a crucial element. It's one of the few countries to have initiatives on data sharing in the private sector, in addition to promoting uh, open access to government data. Japan is also a key player in many international AI initiatives, including the new Global Partnership on AI, whose uh, secretariat, by the way, is hosted by the OECD. Now, Ambassador Kodama, given Japan's relatively good infrastructure to support the digital transformation, the usage of digital technologies among individuals and firms has a very great potential. It can grow a lot because you do have the infrastructure. So to boost the economic dividends from the digital transformation, Japan must also pursue policies to improve business dynamism and the, uh, the ability of firms of all sizes. And I would say here, very importantly, uh, uh, small and medium enterprises to adopt and leverage digital technologies for innovation, for productivity, but of course, most importantly, for job creation. Thank you very much, Secretary General. Again, very, very, uh, I think, uh, interesting, I think, also observation you make. Now, the third question is, uh, is this, in 2016, I was still uh, the ambassador to the OECD back then. I remember the OECD horizon scanning exercise produced a paper which pronounced, uh, one of the mega trends is, the center of gravity of the world economy is shifting east and southward from the west, quote unquote. What is your assessment of the growth potential of the now we say Indo-Pacific region or Asia-Pacific Indo-Pacific region? What role you think can the OECD and Japan uh, play for the sustainable development of the Indo-Pacific region, particularly ASEAN countries? Secretary General, please. Well, you know, short-term economic prospects of ASEAN countries are improving, like is the economy of the whole of the world. But um, the the ASEAN countries, I would say, are are uh, moving uh, in the right direction, uh, thanks to the quick recovery, longer-lasting damage to the economies than looks less less likely. You know, le less what we call scarring. Huh? Uh, nevertheless, uh, there may be this scarring effects related to the incidence of informality mm -hmm. and the question of the closures of schools, because that will leave long lasting impact. Now, some countries will be faced with population aging. Uh, it's not a process of today. It didn't happen because of the pandemic. You know, it was already happening uh, before. Um, and ASEAN countries will, will need to enhance their transition to a low carbon economy as they attempt to get back to growth. As a first step, Japan can share with the lessons learned from its own experience on these matters. Now, the prosperity of Japan and other Asian countries are strongly connected. Thanks to Japan's leadership, Regional trade agreements like the CPTPP, the RCEP, not only lowered the barriers to trade at the border, 
but also they lowered the barriers behind the borders, uh, which sometimes is more important. There are also important steps towards closer regional integration, stronger regional value chains. And Japan has also contributed to the development of Asian countries through providing high quality infrastructure. And this quality infrastructure, the, the, the technology transfer, the official development assistance, uh, quality infrastructure is actually an expression coined by Japan. It's now used all over the world to, to show not only that you build things, but that you have quality in mind when you build it. Uh, and Japan is the one who put it on the table. So Japan and the OECD already have a very fruitful collaboration targeting the development of Asia. Members identified Southeast Asia as the organization's region of strategic priority in a ministerial resolution since 2007. And they said, let's go and try to get a, uh, a uh, you know, more Southeast Asia uh, members. So the OECD uh, Southeast Asia uh, Regional Program, which uh, as I said, uh, we launched with Prime Minister Abe in 2014, is a core tool in our engagement with the region on a wide array of policy subjects, you know, trade, investment, regulations, tax, competition, innovation, infrastructure, SMEs, education, skills, gender, you know, you, you name it. Well, you, you were, you were the, the one who uh, were the father, you know, whatever, the godfather of the project. So you know it uh, very well, Kodama-san. Um, now in February, uh, the OECD launched the latest edition of uh, its flagship report just a few weeks ago. Uh, it's called the OECD Economic Outlook for Southeast Asia, China, and India. We put them all together, looking at the effective use of digital tools in response to COVID-19 in the area of health and education. This particular number of this outlook is about health and education. And Japan has been a longstanding supporter of the outlook, which also benefits from contributions from area. And I salute Nishimura-san, who uh, will uh, join us a little a little later uh, in the uh, uh, in the uh, in the podium. Now we've also published about seven economic surveys of Indonesia. The most recent one launched in March this year. Um, since 2016, we published economic surveys of other Southeast Asian uh, countries like Malaysia, Thailand. But in all the cases we counted on the very general support of the Japanese government to undertake this work. Thank you very much. Now, um, you mentioned, of course, the uh, area. Uh, it's uh, kind of the, uh, is established in the ASEAN region with the, the help of the Japanese government and other also uh, member states of the ASEAN countries as well. Now, may I just invite uh, Secretary General of the area, uh, Professor Nishimura Nishimura-san, Please chip in, chime in, and then just to give uh, your thought on, on, on the area activities in relation Thank to you. cooperation with the Ambassador OECD. Komada. Yeah, please. Kodama. I am Hiroto Nishimura, President of Area. And it's a great honor to join this press conference with Mr. I had a good year, Secretary General of OECD. Area is an international organization established in 2008 to support the economic integration and the development of East Asia towards the OECD of East Asia. We received strong support from Mr. Guria to establish area. In 2014, Mr. Guria's leadership managed to deepen the cooperation between OECD and Asian countries which result in opportunities to steadily drive the region's economic development. Another achievement was the MOU between OECD and ADA, which also contributed to accelerating 
a support for the region and was an important milestone in Nigeria's history as it allows us to further approach the concept of our establishment. Based on the MOU, ADA and the OECD have cooperated on research and policy proposals in various fields related to economic integration in East Asia, such as the development of the ASEAN SME Policy Index and the ASEAN Trade Facilitation Indicator. And on the sideline of the annual ASEAN summit, the OECD and the ADA have taken the opportunities to present the prospects for East Asia's economic development. Last year, for example, in the forum with OECD, we discussed the idea that ASEAN's efficient international production network had contributed to suppressing the negative COVID-19 impact, and that this could be a model for the area of the new normal. It offered this idea as input for the East Asia Summit leaders and ministers. Today, I'm honored to sign the second revision of the MOU. This revision will expand the fields of our cooperation, such as on the environment, and social development. I'm delighted to attend the revised signing ceremony with you after this press conference. Finally, I would like to pay tribute to Mr. Guria for reading the OECD for 15 years. Your foresight and leadership have always guided us and helped us survive many crises. You have advised global readers through providing sub substantive inputs and enhancing the discussions in the G20 meetings, such as in the wake of the global financial crisis in 2008. And with your help, ASEAN has been able to continue its robust development, such as through the ASEAN community building process. Even after you retire, we hope you will continue to give us guidance on the future of the world with your exceptional insights. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Nishimura, for your um, comment and your thought. Um, now, I have just one uh, question uh, for this first half an hour session. Uh, I, I will be very brief and then, uh, but this is, I think it's very important uh, question uh, uh, for all of us. Um, as the new US president, uh, Joe Biden, uh, hosted the climate change summit just a week ago. And then there will also be the COP26 meeting in November uh, in Scotland. And in between, of course, there will be also G7 summit to be hosted by uh, Mr. Uh, well, uh, the Johnson um, uh, in the UK at, in Cornwall region uh, in June. Now, uh, you know, you know, just um, in a nutshell, I think, Secretary General, in what way do you expect uh, Japan also developed economies or China, others to play a role in this, uh, in this global challenge? Well, you know, the recovery is an opportunity to make the growth greener. Recent commitments by Japan and other countries to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050 are encouraging. And the announcement made by President Biden about the fact that they were halving uh, actually 52% drop uh, emissions is just one of the best news we've, we've had. Uh, However, atmospheric CO2 has increased by 50% since the Industrial Revolution. Around 1 million species are at risk of extinction. Uh, you know, talking about biodiversity. Deforestation stands at 10 million hectares per year. And the size of the ocean, what we call dead zones, is doubling every decade 
since the 1960s. Uh, we're seeing greater severity, frequency of extreme weather and what you call slow onset events. Habitat destruction, which accounts for 15% of human caused greenhouse gas emissions also contributes to the spread of diseases from animals to people. Um, and, and you know, you, you, you have this, this, we've gotten used to saying that in 2050, there will be more uh, plastic uh, by weight in the ocean than fish. I mean, it, 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 what is terrible is that we've grown so used to it. Uh, and uh, the coral reefs and the mangroves and the, the, the low-lying um, uh, coastal areas, et cetera. So we need to put a big fat tax on carbon. Now, most emissions in OECD and G20 countries are priced below 30 euros per ton. And 81% of the emissions, 81%, I mean, Practically all of them are priced below 60 euros per ton, which is a level that would have to be reached in 2020 for the world to be broadly on track to deliver on the Paris Agreement. So we are far off track. The Biden summit is very good news because it focuses, it refocuses uh, the, 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 question of, uh, the question of climate because we've been very distracted by the pandemic. It's natural. It's the single most uh, short-term, you know, the, the short-term, the most urgent short-term uh, obligation we have, but uh, the question of, the, uh, of protecting the planet is the single most important intergenerational responsibility. That's the big difference. Now, some governments have recognized this urgency and they're including green recovery measures in the recovery policy packages, you know, on all these trillions that are dedicated to them. However, the balance between green and non-green spending is definitely not encouraging. Uh, our latest analysis shows that what we are doing with one hand, we seem to be undoing with the other hand because of subsidies or because of uh, simply uh, support that is harmful to the environment. Mm -hmm. Now, a number of countries are directing funding towards measures that are likely to have a direct or indirect negative impact on the environment. Uh, is this, uh, for example, uh, plans to roll back uh, some regulations, some unconditional bailouts of emissions intensive industry. So no questions asked, you just support the company regardless of whether the company is uh, emissions intensive. Um, the increased subsidies to fossil fuel intensive infrastructure is, is another matter, you know, hundreds of billions every year. So a truly sustainable recovery requires a coordinated effort within, but also across governments. And Japan is seizing the opportunity for a strengthened multilateral cooperation to, um, as I like to say, build forward better, including through this online, quote, platform for redesign 2020. Um, uh, this is for, for sustainable, resilient recovery from COVID-19. Uh, that was launched September last year. I remember very clearly we, we, we praised it at the time. Uh, the OECD also recently launched a horizontal project on uh, climate and economic resilience. And as I mentioned uh, before, it includes something called the International Program for Action on Climate. And this is like a GPS to know whether we are on the right track or not, you know, to support countries to implement the goals of the Paris Agreement. It's a set of climate related indicators, tailored recommendations, sharing of best practices, a platform to uh, share those best practices, et cetera. 
We're also <laughs> refocusing climate policies through what I would call a well-being lens. Because if it doesn't lead to increased well-being, well, what, what is it for? At our next uh, ministerial council meeting in May, we will report on the development of a dashboard of indicators mm -hmm. to monitor progress towards a strong, resilient, green, inclusive recovery. Actually, last week, we just released the OECD Green Recovery Database, which is tracking the environmental impacts of recovery spending and measures. Uh, it's, it's good reading. Okay. We have okay. A, a number of timely, important events. We have, uh, you mentioned the, 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 um, the US Climate Summit, but also going forward, the UN Biodiversity Summit in, in China, in Kunming. Then we have the Glasgow Summit, uh, and there's also the, in, in 2022, the Oceans Summit. So let's make the most of them. Mm -hmm. uh, our, our, our single most important, most urgent intergenerational responsibility mm -hmm. is to protect the planet. Thank you, Secretary General. Listening to you, actually, I'm sure the viewers, uh, listeners, really, I think, can understand, I think, how really you are a leader of the, not only a think tank OECD, but do tank. Think and do tank OECD. Okay, now, uh, thank you very much. Uh, the remaining time, I have to now open the floor to the, the journalists who are anxious, I'm sure, to ask some questions to you. Um, but but now, now, let me just, um, uh, the uh, yes, uh, you know, um, mention some additional points. I'll take questions from journalists first. And if you'd like to ask a question in English, click the raise hand icon or use the Q&A icon and write down your question. Now, if you have a question in Japanese, in Japanese, just write down your question in Japanese using the Q&A icon. Please make sure to write down your name and affiliation when writing your question. Please also understand that we will not be able to take up all the questions because of time constraints. Now, uh, let me start with actually uh, the submitted questions uh, beforehand. One starting from uh, Indonesian journalist uh, from PT Haryan Waspada, uh, Mr. Rasuddin uh, Shihotang from Jakarta. Thank you for your interest in this conference. His question is simply put, um, again, asked what he would like to ask the Secretary General, how the OECD or you uh, to forecast the recovery of global economy after the COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, what is your answer to this question, Secretary General? Uh, I would say, uh, number one, very, uh, you know, thank you for the question. Number two, every recovery that we can think of has to have every recovery plan at the national level, every recovery plan at the regional level, every recovery plan at the global level. And the better the coordination, the better results we will have. We'll, be, we'll have to be resilient. We'll have to be inclusive because we had left too many people out of the recovery from the 2008-2009. Uh, especially the young and the women, and uh, now the low skilled, uh, low wages, um, and uh, the elderly, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and they have absolutely have to be green. That means sustainable. Um, so uh, I, I, we are going to see different types of national projects depending on fiscal space and depending on how hard those economies were hit. Uh, but it is a wonderful opportunity to build forward better. We cannot go back to where we were before. We don't wanna go back to where we were before because where we were before it was got us into what we have today. Huh? So, and there will be other major accidents. So. Uh, the question is, building forward better is not just uh, a choice. It's not an option. It's the, I would say, the only way to go. Thank you very much. So, you know, now I have a question 
uh, actually uh, as, uh, from the New York Times, uh, Ms. Uh, Motoko Rich. Uh, can you hear me? And if yes. you're ready, please uh, go ahead with your question to Secretary General. Uh, yes, Secretary General, thank you so much for um, meeting with us today. I have a, a question about Japan specifically. When, as you mentioned, the rapidly aging and declining population, but you did not talk about immigration and whether you thought that was necessary for Japan to be more open. And in the sort of green growth strategy, how important do you think nuclear power is for Japan, given their limited ability to develop um, renewable resources um, on a very small land base? Uh, let me start with uh, the question of nuclear. Um, nuclear is not the solution, but it is part of the solution. Um, and um, uh, it, it always has been. Uh, we, of course, know what happened um, in 2011 in Fukushima and uh, all the consequences. But uh, again, uh, we immediately were there. We've been going back uh, systematically uh, with the uh, Nuclear Energy Agency precisely to support Japan in the restarting of its uh, very considerable um, uh, capacity for, um, for nuclear. So I would say, Nuclear, not the ultimate solution, but part of the solution going forward. Um, in terms of um, uh, the uh, question of migration, it's already happening. Uh, already the government has uh, uh, made more flexible uh, uh, rules and uh, a more flexible scheme, as you know. Um, and uh, I think uh, like, uh, every other economy in the world, um, uh, the, the question of uh, migration, uh, well-chosen, well-designed migration policy that is, uh, that, is uh, that chooses well, the type of uh, labor force that is required uh, could help. But as I said, that seems to be already in the, in the wings. Um, now, uh, with the I, I referred to the question of agents of, of uh, rapid aging before. Um, I think one is to, of course, have, uh, you know, you live longer, you work longer. Um, and uh, this is already, I would say, something of a tradition in Japan. Uh, if you look at the average age, for example, of the uh, people who work in the rice in the rice fields, in the rice, in the rice business. Uh, well, uh, they, they are all uh, what would be uh, beyond uh, retirement age in uh, you know, Europe or uh, the United States, et cetera. But uh, of course they, they own the land or they, uh, they're, they're working on the land and they've been doing that for generations and generations. Um, and uh, I think this is becoming more and more obvious in the world, this is not a question of Japan only, the question of aging. Uh, it's in practically every single European um, economy. Uh, it's in many uh, Southeast Asian economies, but uh, in the question of, of Japan, um, uh, the, I think the, uh, the fact that uh, uh, rapid aging has set in uh, a curve is, is dropping very fast. Uh, same thing like in Korea, for example, right now, uh, with a little lag. Uh, but I would say that um, that uh, 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 it's it's uh, so far coping well. But uh, some solutions, like the ones you mentioned a moment ago, about considering the possibility of um, uh, selective migration could also uh, help support the, uh, the, the vitality of the Japanese economy going forward. Thank you, Secretary General. I have two, um, uh, not, not uh, exactly related to the economy, economic policy as such. One is uh, from AFP uh, French journalist, uh, Ms. Etienne Bama. Uh, considering the COVID situation in Japan, do you think the Tokyo Olympic uh, game should be canceled? 
what is your view? Second is, uh, uh, apart from, from Gigi Press, journalist uh, Ms. Leiko Sakurada, uh, concerns the uh, Shinkan or Uyghur situation. Uh, what should Japan do? Um, what role Japan should take now? Sorry, these are disparate questions, but um, uh, any response to these questions would be appreciated, Secretary General. Well, on the question of the Olympics, uh, I can tell you that uh, uh, in Mexico, which was already uh, in 1968, uh, hosted the, the Olympics, and uh, we had a few days before, we had some events which uh, made people doubt whether um, uh, the Olympics would be held or not, and they, they were held very successfully. Uh, now, uh, in the case of uh, Tokyo, um, I'm sure that the consultations between the International Olympic Committee and the authorities uh, in Japan will uh, lead us to the best possible outcome. And uh, I'm sure that uh, if their collective decision is to hold um, uh, the Olympics, uh, they will be very, uh, very successful with the uh, appropriate uh, uh, modalities that have already been established for that purpose. Um, on the question of um, uh, the uh, uh, GG press, uh, let me say uh, that uh, I would uh, defer uh, to the government of Japan and to the foreign uh, uh, ministry of Japan, to their authorities, um, and of course, to the extent that they so decide to the coordination of the uh, authorities of Japan with other authorities uh, around the world on this particular purpose, on this particular issue. Uh, that is not the one on which the OECD can contribute uh, uh, too much, uh, much in-depth uh, analysis. Thank you, Secretary General. Now I have uh, another question from uh, Nikkei uh, Journal. Uh, Mr. To, uh, Togo Shira, Shiraishi uh, concerning the sovereign debt of Japan, Japanese government, um, uh, is the accumulated debt a concern or should be a concern for the Japanese government, concern for the international community or for the OECD? I think uh, there are two, there are two uh, moments. Uh, in the short term, Japan, like uh, most countries, certainly the G7 countries, the OECD countries have dedicated appropriately, correctly, large amounts of resources to support the health sector, to support the victims of the pandemic, and to support the unemployment created by the pandemic, and to support the SMEs, that may be um, in, uh, in, in, in difficulties, even the large companies. Uh, so they have done what um, other countries have done. And I believe that that was the right thing to do. And I am encouraging both the Central Bank of Japan and the fiscal authorities of Japan to continue to do that for the foreseeable future. I think 2021 is going to be still going to be a very tough year, um, and uh, uh, therefore uh, accommodation and uh, some uh, some uh, stimulus is still going to be required. So let's not make the same mistake we made in uh, the 2008-2009 crisis, where we withdrew the support too soon. Um, let's. Uh, be cautious and let's make sure that if we actually start withdrawing the support, it can be gradual. And second, it will only happen once the recovery is well underway, once the recovery is well uh, confirmed. Um, so uh, this, is, uh, this is what I think. Now, uh, what is the pr practical implication that is that if you need deficit financing and therefore more debt issuance, um, 
it should be it should be appropriate it should be necessary yes we would support it uh because what you have is first of all the need to do that in order to get out of this of the hole but second because at the very low interest rates that we have today you really are better equipped or you are uh let's say you don't you don't pay such a high price now having said that um we go back to before the pandemic okay before the pandemic um we were constantly saying okay uh very low interest rates in japan therefore not very high cost of servicing the debt um which is which makes it more manageable but clearly uh, the question of consolidation has to be addressed now the question of consolidation was moved um in several locations to different uh, uh to different uh, uh you know by two years by three years by four years etc um and i think it is something that is still um what i would call homework uh, that is that is pending but not now not now this is not the right time um only until the uh, recovery of growth is um, well underway you you are you're muted uh, kodama san you're so, muted. So, you know, yes right. um, maybe uh one maybe final question actually uh, but actually which is uh my own actually because i really would like to ask this question to you so you know yeah. you are a great communicator uh whenever you are wherever you went to g20 g7 or un or whatever i think but i uh i my question is this uh, a pivotal moment for the oecd uh during your 15 years was the, the global financial crisis now in order to respond to the global financial crisis the g20 summit was born in 2008 from the very beginning OECD was invited to the G20 summit together with the IMF and the World Bank. Chance favors the prepared mind. Uh, if I said the March 20 G20 London summit uh, chaired by Gordon Brown was a game changer for the OECD, would I be overstating it? I just quote the key sentence in the communique, which says the era of banking secrecy is over. We note the OECD has today published a list of countries assessed by the global forum against the international standard for exchange of tax information unquote so how did you manage uh, to persuade the BRICS countries india or china chinese leaders uh, in the g20 who are not members of the oecd to allow the oecd back then still considered in some quarters a club of rich countries a mandate in the G20 framework since then. OECD, I know, Secretariat has been a de facto secretary, a permanent secretariat of some of the G20 members. Anyway, you know, so could you just reminisce uh, uh, what happened it, and uh, then, you know, what is your view on this? Uh, it's, uh, it's with results. I mean, uh, the question of, of avoiding um, tax evasion or tax illusion uh or 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 Pep's moving, initiative yes moving your place to the place where you have the least taxation or where you don't have uh, uh any taxation etc um is something which everybody shared regardless of whether they were oecd members or whether they were actually uh some members of the oecd were involved in those practices mm -hmm. Uh, as you remember very well, because we had some difficulties uh, in the council itself. So we've, we've come a long way. Right now, we have 84 million bank accounts that have been exchanged and that are in the desks of the tax directors in each country. So all the Turkish citizens are in the hands of the Turkish uh, director of taxes and all the Mexican citizens are in the hands of the Mexican director of taxes 
and Japan's the same, and Italy the same, and the United States the same, et cetera. So what happens? This 84 million bank accounts worth 10 trillion, trillion euros, that is about half the size of the US economy, Kodama-san. This is the size of the progress that we have made. And I would tell you today, there is no where to hide. People are running around saying, okay, how can I fix this? Because they know that their name is gonna come out. Now, having done that, because that's done, that's going to happen every year. It's going to happen every year. It's happening with more and more and more countries. 100 countries are exchanging information, more will exchange information every year. But now the latest is the question of digital taxation. How do we account for the taxation of a growing digital economy? It's not about the digital companies. It's about a growing digitalization of the economy. And how do you tax the biggest multinationals in the world that have tens of billions, hundreds of billions of business and that earns uh, you know, tens of billions of dollars in, in revenue, uh, how do you make them just pay their fair share? And second, how do you make them pay at least part of the taxes in the places where they actually do the business, where they generate the profits? So this means we, we eliminate, we change the nexus rule, which means that you have to have a permanent presence because you don't have to, you don't need a permanent presence to do uh, internet business. And second, it's a question of allocating the, uh, the uh, taxing rights among the countries. And there's another part, which is the minimum taxation, which as you know, has now become a big, big initiative by uh, President uh, Biden and uh, Janet Yellen, the Secretary of the Treasury, and which was already part of the, it was what we call pillar two, of the approach to um, uh, digital taxation. Um, and uh, uh, so therefore we're, we're very excited. We're very happy. We think that come July, uh, we can have a deal uh, that uh, can go in the direction of taxing, having homogeneous rules around the world to tax uh, digital uh, and at the same time to avoid a, uh, to avoid a uh, uh, what we call a race to the bottom and second, to avoid uh, trade tensions derived from different uh, national initiatives to tax uh, the, the digital economy. Uh, so having an OECD uh, deal, uh, a multilateral agreement is the best way and we will avoid all these tensions. Thank you very much, because you know, as time has almost run out, I would now uh, like to conclude this briefing. I would once again, from the bottom of my heart, Secretary General, thank you very much for sharing your thank precious you so time much. With, with us, with your insights with us. Um, thank you also, ladies and gentlemen. I would now uh, uh, like to invite you to, well, now also we have actually, a foreign presenter will organize the webinar seminar, maybe this fall. I would like to invite you all again, come back to our webinar seminar. So thank you all uh, for uh, taking part in today's a wonderful, insightful a press briefing given by Secretary General, Mr. Anahin Kuria. Thank you all. Secretary General again, thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all for joining us.